Hey everybody, welcome back to Readers of Right. Today we're going to tackle one big question when it comes to the Warhammer 40k universe, and that is, where should you start? For that, I'm going to be reviewing probably my favorite book in the Warhammer 40k universe, The Founding by Dan Abnett. This story is a great introduction to Warhammer 40k universe. Um, I actually have a video that goes over this in a little bit more detail. Uh, so make sure to check that out after we're done here. And it really is a critical place to start. Wherever 40K Universe is broad, and there's a lot that goes on with it. It can be very hard to dive into because a lot of times most books assume you already know the basics. Um, and for people like me who actually started through the novels and not through the war game, that's not the case. There's a lot that you don't know uh, going into it. And Gaunt's Ghost, the series that the founding is the first book of, eases you into that while still giving you the very character driven Band of Brothers feel that is fairly common in the Warhammer 40k universe. There's a lot of military characters going through things that they wouldn't normally go through. Um, and this is the introduction to it. Uh, not everyone will want to start here and that's fine uh like i said one of the big other directions you can go is getting into warhammer through the actual war game and if you start there you will have the foundations you need and you'll probably have a faction you're loyal to so starting with that faction is a great way to go too but for 90 percent of readers that i've talked to most people started with the books at least here in the United States. Abroad in the UK, that may not be the case where Warhammer stores are frequent and all over the place. Uh, that is not the case here. Um, here, for example, in the state of Utah where I live, there is one store for the entire state, a state that's roughly the same size as the entire UK. Um, actually, probably bigger in squared miles, uh, but top to bottom about the same. Um, so we don't have the luxury of having Warhammer plastered all over shopping centers and malls and everywhere you go. We have to find it other ways. Uh, so typically that will be word of mouth. Um, but a lot of times we're pointed to the books first. Now, to be clear, we do have game stores, but game stores here are far more broad and may have a small corner that's reserved for Warhammer. Uh, my local game store, for example, has all of five or six shelves with Warhammer stuff, and it's in the far corner. Uh, their big things are Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons, which are super common here, at least everywhere I've been in the United States. And those, plus other um, usually World War II themed war games, seem to be the most popular. But I know for a fact Warhammer is a massive community and it is growing rapidly in the United States. So I wanted to create this video to kind of give that introduction. So let's talk about the founding and talk about why you should read it. I already gave the brief, brief summary that I like to give to anybody who is even interested in talking about the founding with me. My first question is, did you like the show Band of Brothers? Almost everyone I've talked to who has seen the show says yes, especially if you're an action per person who likes action movies or history buff. And if you like Band of Brothers, you will love the founding. The founding is literally just the Band of Brothers feel in space. We start out with the main character, Ibram Gaunt, a commissar who is sent to take command of one of the regiments of the Tanith as they prepare to go on to a crusade. At the time, it is a peaceful world, and the Tanith have been given unique abilities by the planets they live on, allowing them to hunt and track through woods that literally move and migrate. Uh, they are, they're also experts stel at stealth, and a lot of them are expert sharpshooters as well. So they are highly prized and highly valuable to the Imperial Crusade against 
an organization called the Blood Pact that come up more and more throughout the story. Uh, and Gaunt is kind of an exception. Uh, normally, the commissar or political officer of the Imperial Guard does not have command. His job is to make sure that everyone stays in line and does what they're supposed to do, as well as keep morale up and be... A therapist isn't the right word, but he's there to help the men when they need it, whether that be through conversation, through joking, or sometimes through a bullet. Uh, if you have a thief or a murderer, the commissar is the one who takes care of it. He's a weird hybrid of military police and a chaplain and other things that historically have proven not to be so good. Uh, to be clear, Warhammer, Grimdark. No real good guys. Period. Uh, and the environment of the Imperium and the Imperial Army, very much that way. Now, some of the characters I would define as good people. They may be in terrible situations and have to do things that are not great in order to survive and accomplish their missions. But, for example, Ibram Gant, genuinely a good guy. He's one of the few military commanders who actively wants to preserve life if possible. He actually tries to think of ways to succeed in attacks that may be unconventional, but still accomplish the mission or accomplish the mission better. Um, and this is why he's become a Colonel Commissar. He is the only Commissar in the entire Imperial Army, as far as it's ever been mentioned, that has both a command rank and a commissariat rank. And this is very weird for a lot of people. It would be like the medic and being the commanding officer of an infantry battalion in the military just does not make sense. But Ibram Gaunt has earned it through stepping up in command and taking over command of units that he'd been in where the commander was killed and proved to be an exceptional military talent. So he sent to go take command of one of the battalions, or regiments, excuse me, coming at one of the three regiments coming out of Tanith. But as they're mustering, things go terribly wrong. Chaos and the factions of Chaos decide that that is the planet they want to attack to stop the Tanith from actually getting out into space. And the characters we're introduced to have to choose. Do they try and fight in a battle that is clearly meaningless? By meaningless, I mean they will be vastly overwhelmed very quickly. Or do they flee to space and join the crusade? And that is one of the biggest moral dilemmas I think I've ever seen in a book one ever. People are leaving their families behind, which originally they thought they were leaving their families behind set up to succeed uh, because vol by volunteering for the Imperial Army to pay the Imperial Army tax or tithe, as the Imperium calls it, they are preserving their family status and elevating their family status in some cases in society and helping everyone around them that they love move forward in life. And that's something that was often very true in the past. Uh, so if we look at history, uh, a lot of these musterings and things like that, the voluntary musterings that happened during the early 100 years war and things like that, you would see this where if an eldest son or a father would step up to join the ranks, that family would be handsomely rewarded. A lot of times if an eldest son went, that resulted in more land for a farmer or a government contract for someone who specializes in manufacturing or any of thousands of things that would make their life improve. Sometimes there's just a cash payment. And this is what a lot of the Tanith are joining for. Uh, there are also a group of criminals that are being sent to a more suicidal squad. Um, and unfortunately, this squad is under Gaunt. So through all of this, they have to find a way to save as much as possible while not being able to save everything. It's a wild turmoil, and 
it's heart wrenching, really, especially the the first of the three books that make up the founding. Um, originally, these were three books. Uh, they were first and only Ghostmaker and ne Necropolis. Uh, so far, we've only talked about first and only because that's where a lot of the non spoiler stuff is. So we are able to see all of this take effect, effect. and they have to make the decision on what to do and how to do it. Okay. We're going to break here. This is where we enter the spoiler mode. Anything beyond this point is spoilery. So if you don't want to hear the spoilers for the next two books, um, pause it here and I will write up here, put the timestamp for where you can jump to safely and get my final summary without hearing the spoilers. Okay, welcome back. Let's dive into the actual spoilers of this story. First, we're going to start with First and Only. First and Only has some very heart-wrenching moments. And one of my personal favorites comes near the end, where Gaunt is trying to escape the Chaos Warriors that are coming at him. And he's one of the last ones in the castle. He's pulled as many people onto the landing craft as he can. They're taking off and... Right as he's about to go, he gets caught. And the person who saves him is a young boy who's a palace piper. Bryn Milo saves him and they get into space. And this is this was when I knew I was hooked. Um, I've now read every single book that's available from Gaunt's Ghosts. And I absolutely recommend doing that. They are fantastic. Um, Ghostmaker and Vervin and Necropolis, excuse me, go even further into this. It's um, some fantastic stories about how the ghosts became the ghosts. This single unit of legend that is slowly adopting people from throughout the galaxy that are the abandoned and the lost. A lot of them are from lost worlds or lost cities like Vervenhive uh, that you get to see a little bit later. Um, I believe that's in Necropolis. It's a little blended together now. But uh, you get to see this blended mishmash of light infantry and scout troops come together and become the unit of absolute legend by the end of the series. Now... Don't get comfortable with characters. There's literally only one of them that guaranteed to live. And his name is Ibram Gaunt. Because he is 60% of the story. He is the main character. He has plot armor. Although that plot armor gets tested a lot. So, keep that in mind. You will fall in love with characters no matter what you do. But this is Warhammer. Characters will die. This is almost Game of Thrones level, um, although a lot of time they don't kill characters to kill characters. Every single one of the characters that's killed is jarring. So, brace for it. It is worth it. Okay. This is where we're going to break from the spoilers a little bit and bring everybody back. Okay. I hope everybody's back and was able to dodge the spoilers. If you did, great. Uh, if you listen to the spoilers too, great. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Once you read the book, please come back, give it a second watch, and let me know what you guys think on those spoilers. And if you've read this book already, also let me know in the comments. What was your favorite part, and what are some of the things you look forward to with the rest of the series? So, the themes of this book, a lot of it's based around sacrifice and choosing what is the level of sacrifice that you're okay with and what is true sacrifice. Uh, this is a question that uh, Gaunt brings up in a couple different conversations about how by leaving the planet, they're sacrificing in a way that will actually achieve something instead of a meaningless sacrifice. 
uh, where they stay to fight. And this theme is something that a lot of people don't think about. Uh, it's not a situation a lot of us get put in, but is a heart-wrenching, heart-wrenching thing to think about. About what you would do if you were put in that situation and how you would, or whether you would choose to survive or choose to give your life alongside those you care about. And it's something that, honestly, I've thought a lot about and I don't know how I would do it. I really don't. But it is a theme that I think is fantastic and is very, very well addressed. Um, writing. Okay. So now that we've talked about a theme a little bit, let's talk about the writing style and pacing. First off, pacing wise, it's fast. Things move at a very good clip. Uh, that's true with Dan Abner across the board. He does do a very good job of pacing it in a way that you can keep up. He doesn't overwhelm you. Um, and his, pa his pacing grows gradually. Uh, he doesn't have what Brandon Sanderson calls the Sanderlanch, where things often, almost like a roller coaster with Brandon Sanderson, things go up, they crest a little bit, and then it's straight downhill towards the end. For Dan, they kind of stack on layers and build until you reach that pinnacle where you just can't take it anymore and you can just feel that pressure coming. And when that pressure reaches that breaking point, then he lets it out and it goes. And it'll either wrench at your soul or it will leave you so hyped that you're excited to keep going or it will shock you. Uh, it's a pacing that I love and as an author has affected my writing style a lot. Um, honestly, one of the authors that I've learned the most in my writing and prose from is Dan. He does a very good job of keeping it simple and keeping it not too flowery, um, which isn't true about all black library authors, but it's approachable. It's clean. It's smooth. The pacing is fantastic. And his writing style is also fantastic he knows how to toe that line of grimdark without crossing the line of grimdark uh grimdark sometimes gets too dark but grimdark has to toe that line where it's dark enough that you wonder if there's hope but there's just enough light at the end of the tunnel to let you know that there is maybe we'll see and that is so good especially gaunt's ghost i think is one of the best that it does or that does it um where that line between dark and grim dark is visible it's flirted with but he never crosses it and it never leaves you in complete despair and for that for that reason in my personal opinion dan is probably my favorite black library author there are several in second and third um, including a few close friends. Um, I'm going to do a book review on one of those, hopefully here in a few weeks. Uh, but this level of Grimdark is a very, very good story base. That allows Dan to actually tell a character-driven story in a very military-driven universe. Uh, a lot of Warhammer books are very combat-heavy and or as character driven, which in a lot of cases is necessary. That's fine. There are characters who are so bland, but you have to tell a story from their perspective that it just has to be done. But in the founding and Gaunt's Ghost, that is not the case. If you like character driven Grimdark, this is for you. And I absolutely recommend it. It is definitely in one of my top five best novels of all time. So, We've talked about the founding. It is a fantastic book. Like I said, it does have three books inside it. So if you're wanting to do the audiobooks, or in some cases the ebooks, uh, the first and only, or first and only is the first book in this. That's where you'll find it. Um, I will leave a link, link in the description uh, to its Amazon page or maybe the Black Library page or both. Uh, so make sure you check those out. Uh, this is just me wanting to share my 
personal favorite Warhammer book with you. Um, if you've got recommendations for any books you'd like me to review, uh, let me know in the comments below. And if you have any comments or questions about Gaunt's Ghosts, let me know below as well, or the Warhammer community as a whole. I look forward to hearing you guys, and we'll see you next time.